Thank you very much, Max, for the introductions. And can I uh, greet the many distinguished guests we have here, beginning, of course, with our panel and Minister Maria from Uganda, Mayor Patricia from Cape Town, uh, Secretary General Nerul from Malaysia, Madam Nin from Vietnam, and uh, uh, MP Intan from Singapore. Uh, also acknowledge uh, many uh, eminent guests in the audience, including uh, New Zealand High Commissioner Bernadette Cavadar. Thank you for being here, Bernadette. Uh, I see Mayor Sally from Waverley in uh, New South Wales. She represents a lot of New Zealanders at Bondi Beach, she tells me. <laughs> Uh, we also have our UNDP uh, resident representative, uh, uh, Michelle Giles uh, McDonough, sitting in the front row. Michelle is based in KL, but covers Singapore as well. We have Patrick from headquarters. We have many wonderful people here, so thank you all for coming for uh, what Max has termed as the inaugural lecture uh, here at the centre. And I should say we were enormously assisted by the government of Singapore to set up this global centre, uh, policy centre for excellence in public service. Uh, we set it up here because we know how much the quality of public service has contributed to Singapore's development. From the very outset of this new nation in the 1960s, uh, there was a very firm line. We will be a state which is corruption-free. Uh, we will have a quality public service. And this has served Singapore extremely well in its accelerated decade over the past 49 years and acknowledging that next year, the 50th anniversary, is a very major event uh, in the uh, life of the independent nation of Singapore. So with our centre, we've just produced a, a report on the, the first year of activities and reports and papers uh, submitted. I've had a meeting with our, our little team here uh, this morning and really looking forward to supporting and hearing more of their work, uh, which is in essence to share knowledge of successful experiences improving the quality of public service and through the centre to catalyse new thinking, strategy and action on achieving public service uh, excellence. Uh, it is making relevant research and knowledge on public administration widely available. It has already held a number of high-level events before this one, and it has brought practitioners together uh, to reflect on evidence and trends. It has supported conversations on topics ranging from strategies to modernise the public administration of Iraq to the importance of a systems approach to addressing public administration needs and challenges in the small island developing states. The latter, by the way, very relevant this year because the third United Nations Conference on Small Island Developing States will be held in Samoa in the first week of uh, September. So, uh, to today's event uh, on women's equal participation and leadership in decision making, a global development priority, something everyone on this panel knows rather a lot uh, about. And uh, as Max has introduced me, I will not say more about my own experience except to say that it has been extensive in breaking through glass ceilings and uh, uh, breaking through a big enough hole, hopefully, for many others to uh, follow as well. So let me start uh, with a, a statement of principle about the importance of gender equality as a human right. Uh, many United Nations and regional organisations, instruments, conventions and declarations uphold the equal rights of women and men and have helped clarify that women's rights are indeed human rights. We can go back to the Charter of the United Nations, uh, the CEDAW Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Beijing Platform for Action uh, of 1995 from the huge UN Women's Conference uh, held in, in China, and Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, which affirmed for the first time at that level that women had an absolute right to be part of every stage of peace building, peacemaking processes in their country. We can also look to the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, which came from the World Conference on Human Rights in 1993, which said, quote, 
the full and equal participation of women in political, civil, economic, social, and cultural life at the national, regional, and international levels, and the eradication of all forms of discrimination on grounds of sex are priority objectives of the international community. So, against this very principled background, going back to 1945 and the Charter, are we making progress with women's equality at the leadership level? Well, the answer is yes, but not fast. So, the number of heads of state and government who are women stands at just over 20. I guess it's a little bit better than when I went to the Millennium Summit of the United Nations in 2000, September, and Mary Robinson, who was the UN Human Rights Commissioner, convened a meeting of women heads of UN agencies and women heads of government and state. It was almost possible to hold that meeting in a telephone box. Uh, in the event, it was held in a very small room. I remember there was uh, Mary, and there was Gro Harlem Brundtland, former Prime Minister of Norway, who headed uh, the World Health Organization at the time. And among the women heads of government, I think there were about four of us able to go. One was the president of Latvia. Uh, there was me. I think there was a prime minister from Dominica, and the prime minister of Bangladesh. We were a very cosy little group. Uh, <laughs> But truly, it, it was insufficient, and uh, the total of around 21 today is clearly insufficient. Around the world, only some 18% of ministers in governments are women. And it's also true that women, for the most part, in these ministerial positions tend to be in the social sectors. Let me not imply for a moment that the social sectors are unimportant. They're extremely important, education, health, uh, social services generally. But we would also like to see women popping up more in the finance ministries, the economic ministries, the industry sector ministries, etc. Uh, so yes, very happy to be running education, health and social services, but could we run some other things as well, I think is the, is the message. On the average proportion of women's participation in national parliaments, that is standing at around 22% at the moment. Obviously, 22% is far below actual parity, uh, but it's also below the internationally agreed minimum target, which was set at 30% uh, in 1990 uh, at ECOSOC. It was emphasized in the Beijing uh, Women's Conference outcome in 1995, and then it was picked up in the Millennium uh, Development Goals uh, of 2000. There are 37 countries in which women account for under 10% of parliamentarians in single or lower houses. In 2013, we saw an increase in the global average of the number of women MPs of 1.5% over the year before, which was actually a slightly better jump than we'd been used to seeing. But if we only improved the annual rate of increase at 1.5% a year, it would take another 20 years before we got to gender parity, which is quite a long time as well. Uh, so to really move towards gender equality, in political representation as reflected in our parliaments, we're going to need to be very innovative and step up uh, what we know does work uh, to remove the persistent barriers which have held women back uh, from taking their equal places at these tables. UNDP's work in this area, we are the largest implementer in the world of parliamentary support programming. And in all of it, we work to support women's equal participation and leadership in parliaments and the political processes. In the Pacific, and I uh, specify Samoa, Tonga, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and Kiribati, we have been working to address the severe underrepresentation of women in the legislatures. And some of that work has included holding what we've called practice parliaments in which women candidates can come together, practice parliamentary debating and committee work skills, and discuss electoral tactics. 
We also provided support uh, to Samoa to amend its constitution, which happened last year, to create five reserved seats for women. And we did the same with previous attempts to promote reserved seats in Papua New Guinea. You know, special measures aren't always liked, but they are effective. They are a quick start. Hopefully the time comes as uh, communities, populations get used to having more women in parliament where you don't need them. But special measures can certainly be a kickstart. Another example from far away in Tunisia, uh, we work to raise awareness among members of that country's National Constituent Assembly, which was put in place uh, following uh, the, the, the change uh, from the older style authoritarian regime to the transition to something else. Uh, we sensitized those members of the assembly on what the international best practice on gender equality provisions and constitutions is. And when Tunisia adopted its new constitution in January this year, it has in it uh, constitutional commitments to work towards parity in all elected bodies. Very important. I might say it also has uh, commitments to eliminate violence against women and its constitution uh, and to promote women's assumption of responsibility in all sectors. This is a state-of-the-art new constitution uh, uh, of great uh, relevance to women. Now, other areas of leadership, uh, women's leadership or uh, the relative uh, absence of it in the private sector is also starting to receive uh, much more attention. And often when I've spoken on this subject, I've referred to the world's corporate sectors as the last bastion of male dominance of top positions or even middle and senior management uh, positions. I often judge this in a country by looking at who's on uh, the red eye special plane in the morning when you're making <laughs> a, a business trip. And I have to say, whether it's my own country or the United States or wherever, there still aren't enough women on these planes, right? <laughs> so that's, that's my test. Uh, uh, but there is, of course, rather more um, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, information available as well. In OECD countries, women account for under one-third of senior managers, and there's only one woman for every 10 men on corporate boards. Now, in 2012, the Honourable Halima Yaqob, who's now Speaker of the Singapore Parliament, in her previous position as Minister of State in the Ministry of Social and Family Development, uh, initiated a review of gender diversity on boards in this country and among the senior management of the companies listed on the Singapore Exchange. This review, published in April by the Diversity Task Force here, found that women in Singapore hold just over 8% of directorships on these boards and that the current rate of growth in numbers would represent only 17% of directors by 2030. Recent research has looked at gender balance in the top 300 companies across the United States, Europe and Asia and makes the case that gender balance needs to be pursued not only on the boards of the corporates, but also among the senior managers on executive committees who report directly to the CEO. 38 of the top 100 companies in Europe and 71 of the top 100 in Asia have no women at all in their executive management teams. Incredible, isn't it? There's a lot to be done. There is mounting evidence that women's equal participation in leadership positions is of benefit to families, societies, economies, and countries. Where we have a critical mass of women present in policy and decision-making, our parliaments seem to be more likely to address a wider range of gender equality issues, whether that is by, for example, passing law to combat gender-based violence, as in Rwanda, which leads the world in the proportion of women in its legislature. Whether it's ensuring free health services and education for adolescent mothers, as happened in Costa Rica when the critical mass of women started to rise, or by adopting gender quotas for representation in a number of countries. And when we come to the private sector, the research evidence is also pointing in the direction of companies which include women in their decision-making 
performing better. Uh, there's been one study that looked at the nine companies in India run by women and how they outperformed the 30 leading listed for firms on the Bombay Stock Exchange in year-on-year -year growth rates from 2004 to 2009. So I think the economic case for women's equal participation and decision-making in the private sector can certainly be made. And it's been made by as powerful an advocate as Hillary Clinton, who famously said that uh, uh, gender equality is uh, not only the right thing to do, it's also smart economics. And sometimes, if all the other arguments don't work, you resort to economics and say, well, actually, everyone will be better off if you do this as well, by the way. Uh, a strong argument. Millennium Development Goal 3 made the advancement of wom women's empowerment and gender equality a global priority. But of course, achieving MDG 3 was very linked to the achievement of other MDGs, including reduction of poverty, hunger, maternal, infant and child mortality, and reaching universal school enrollment. All those targets become hard to reach if women are not empowered and don't enjoy gender equality. I think the beauty of the MDGs is actually they're very interlinked. And when we look at this next global development agenda post-2015 and sustainable development goals, we need to keep those linkages. Achieve one thing, you're likely to achieve others. And uh, if there is uh, a, a silver bullet in development, it is the empowerment of women and gender equality for really lifting societies across all these other kinds of, of uh, indicators. Now, let me come to gender equality in public administration, a rather uh, neglected area of, of research and focus uh, to date. Uh, as a matter of principle, when public administration is guided, uh, by fairness, equality and justice, and when it walks the talk itself, it can be a role model for the society it serves. Public administration at the central, regional and local government levels is the central instrument through which policies and programs are implemented. So having women equally represented uh, right through public administration must be seen as a top development priority for all our societies. To date, women are numerically well represented in many public administrations, but they remain significantly outnumbered by men in leadership positions in those administrations in many countries. And at UNDP, we've been working to raise awareness of the importance of having the women well represented in the upper echelons as well. So as part of our efforts uh, we're presenting to you today, I'm told it's a soft launch, Patrick, a soft launch of our report on gender equality in public administration. And it draws on available national data and on the findings of 13 country case studies which highlight good practice around the world in advancing women's participation and leadership in public administration. It looks at key trends and challenges and it makes some recommendations on further steps, which, if taken, would accelerate women's equal participation. What does it find? Well, it finds that women continue to experience challenges and barriers related to recruitment, retention, and promotion in public administrations. Just as in the political uh, system, the private sector and other spheres, there is a range of social norms and structural factors which continue to obstruct women's equal role in public administration. In many countries, these encouraging absolute numbers of women in public administrations hide the reality that the participation at the top levels is really rather low. In only a few countries do women occupy more than 40% of the top echelons of the civil service. And in addition to glass ceilings, there may also be glass walls, uh, as reflected again in the overrepresentation in the social or so-called uh, soft sectors, like education, health, social services, culture, and the underrepresentation of women in public administration in those finance economic, industry sector, 
etc., so-called hard uh, areas. Then we find that there uh, can be aspects of national policy and legislation which continue to discriminate against women quite directly, such as through unequal ages of retirement for women and men. If the women have to retire earlier, their career is a little truncated, isn't it? And you often only get to the very top towards the end of your, your time in, in uh, uh, career service. Uh, then there might also be indirect uh, discrimination. For example, where uninterrupted years of service are required to qualify for entry to certain senior positions. Hello. What often happens in women's life, they take a little time out to have their babies and be at home with the children when they're young. So if there's a requirement for uninterrupted service, that obviously is going to impact uh, very directly on women. So with these findings in mind, our report calls for things like the following. Increased investment in women and girls including through formal and informal education, training, mentoring, networking, and fast-track initiatives in order to speed up progress in achieving and keeping there a critical mass of women in this sphere, as indeed in all others. Taking concrete steps to remove the structural barriers which have been impeding equals, equal representation in decision-making circles and put the necessarily enabling environment in place. Those steps could include constitutional, and I've given you this wonderful example of Tunisia. Uh, there's another very wonderful example too from South Africa, which is state-of-the-art constitution on gender equality. I mean, these founding documents are extremely uh, important. Uh, there could be legislative steps that could be taken. There could be policy foundations. Uh, and as I referred to earlier, there can be special measures. They're not always liked, but they can be very effective. Uh, and then if we're going to transform the position of women in the workforce, uh, particularly at the top levels, uh, we do need much greater commitments to work-life balance policies and practices because people don't work in a vacuum or without a context. They work in that context of family. And not only children, uh, women in uh, families around the world also disproportionately have uh, responsibility for the support of the older relatives, the relatives who are ill, uh, the relatives who may have uh, disabilities. Uh, we feel that uh, particular responsibility and, uh, and often take it. I can say with a 92-year-old father, this becomes something that's always, always on one's mind. Another critical issue highlighted in the report is that no global tracking mechanism of women's place in decision-making and public administration exists at the moment. But what is measures matters. Actually, if you don't measure it, it tends not to count at all. Uh, so this data gap reflects the lack of priority given uh, to the issue of women in public administration. And we need to build an evidence base around this. We need gender disaggregated data uh, on what is actually happening. And this is uh, something our report specifically calls for, and we will be working further on. So we're hoping that this new report and its concrete recommendations will be seen as a very useful tool for supporting policy work, programming, and advocacy in this area. And we hope it will stimulate a lot of discussion and action with all our partners around the world on the importance of women's equal participation in public administration. In closing, uh, let me say again that advancing women's equal leadership is of wide benefit beyond uh, the uh, importance to women themselves, to their families, their communities, their countries. Without women's equal participation, public administration and anything else does not tap into the full potential of a country's workforce capacity and creativity. There are also a number of contexts where public administration 
may be one of the few acceptable career options for women in a country. So if women can't get to the top of that, where will they be able to show uh, their talents in the workforce? This is another reason why public administration is a very important area to focus on. Uh, so we think uh, that efforts in this area do need to be prioritised, scaled up, coordinated and made much more visible, uh, and that we need champions among women and men uh, on this uh, issue. At UNDP, we'll play our part, including by supporting more research and through the programming that we do in the, all the countries we work in, 177 countries and territories, and we're often called on to work in these areas. And we count on all of you here today as champions of this kind of work and to join us in making gender equality in public administration a reality uh, well within our lifetimes. Uh, thank you. Helen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, a tour de force, and uh, it's great to have that passion. I always tell my friends, even if I didn't believe in gender equality, I have three sisters and no brothers, two daughters and no sons, <laughs> so I would get beaten up. Uh, uh, with uh, that, um, can I ask Helen then to kick off a conversation with the panel? Helen, thank you. Thank you, Max, and we won't beat you up because we don't believe in gender-based violence. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right, so we're going to go into some uh, questions for our very eminent panel. And my first questions are going to go to Minister Maria from Uganda, uh, Minister of Wildlife, Tourism and Antiquities, and then uh, also same question to Nurul Ainur Maud Nur, Secretary General of Ministry of Women, Family and Community in Malaysia. We're going to ask each of them to talk a little about their personal experiences as women coming up to these very important leadership positions. Tell us you know, what it was like, what were the challenges, uh, were there any other women leaders you could look to uh, in this uh, work, uh, either as role models or people who mentored you or peers who helped you a little bit uh, along the way when you were getting to the top? So, Minister Maria, can I ask you to reflect on those issues? Okay, thank you very much, our chair, and uh, I will greet you all. Warm greetings from Uganda. I believe a number of you know where Uganda is. <laughs> it is a land-linked country, not landlocked, uh, in the middle of uh, the equator of Africa, and uh, we call ourselves the power of Uganda, the power of Africa. Uh, I really feel honored that I should be considered uh, an experienced uh, a public administrator, indeed, I'm not a, a public administrator. I've never had any lesson in public administration. I, by accident, found myself in public administration. I'm professionally an economist. I worked with the Central Bank of Uganda. And thereafter, I became a mother. But I really want to say that the profession of a mother trained me to be a public administrator. Mm. Because definitely there, you handle everything. And when it comes to Africa, it is really mean the everything. So you've got to know how to manage your time as a mother, as a housewife, and as a working woman, because I was working in the central bank. So that taught me the discipline of uh, managing time, managing people, managing a family. Then I think another influence that came in is there was a change of government. And the new government came in, and I think the leadership had a vision of making women you know, more productive, because there were very many, but it was considered that women were not really very active. Mm -hmm. So they were meant to be brought at the front. And uh, in, I joined the politics in 1989. Our government came in 1986. And in 1989, there was a, an effort to try to bring in women Mm -hmm. I remember my primary teacher approaching me in my bank and saying, can you please come and represent us at parliament level? I just didn't know what it meant. 
And he insisted, insisted so much that finally my husband said, you go, your people want you, I will not stop you. So I went home and I was elected a woman representative. Mm. And that's all, I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> but the first thing I met the president, he asked me, mm -hmm, tell me about yourself. I told him, and I was coming from a district that was most devastated by HIV AIDS. So he gave me a responsibility to say, now you are the mother of orphans of those people in the district. Mm. That's when I woke up, say, oh, there is something to be done. I went home, I took a tour of all the entire district, and I took stock of the orphans there. Immediately, as the mother, it became my burden, mm. it became my challenge, it became my commitment. And that's how I became a politician. I actually had to commit myself to serve those orphans. So time moved on. And, uh, I, but at that time, again, I was in the opposition. I was opposing the government in place with all the principles and their values. But I headed uh, a campaign of my candidate then. I was the chairperson of his candidature and his campaign. And I think the president noted something in me which I didn't know. So we really had a struggle and I nearly got my candidate to win. So when we lost, as he was being swearing in for the second time, he said, but I will need to work with that woman. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody rushed to me. I was still nursing my wounds of having failed. He said, but the president says he's going to work with you. I said, what? What is that? So a few months later, he called me and said, look, I know you, you want to, you, you can serve, but can you come and work with me? But I said, I belong to another part. I said, don't worry, you want to serve Ugandans. And I'm giving you an opportunity to serve Ugandans. And I want you to look at the sector. So that's how I went into government in year 2000. And since that time, I'm still in government. Mm -hmm. I was, in 2000, November, I was made Minister of State for Water. Again, the president asked me, I have two portfolios. There was one for trade, another one for water. By that time, I didn't have water in my house. I was still carrying water on my head from a river. Wow. So the president, I told him, well, you know, I want to do business. I want to do commerce, trade. I want, in fact, I even started calculating what kind of business I was going to do. Two days later, he told me, I'm sorry. He asked me, which one do you want? I said, I want to do trade. He said, I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you. Can you do water for me? I didn't know. What is there about water? <laughs> so that's when I started looking at water. Again, I realized it was part of me as a woman because water in Africa mm. is a woman affair. Yes. So I really had to go in and try to solve the problem of a woman. I have the orphan, I have the woman issue. Mm. And because of that, it became a commitment. So for me, it has, it has stopped being a po uh, uh, politics, it has become my lifestyle. I uh, actually had to advance the water issues in my country to make sure that we get better budget, better technologies, better participation. And then went to the regional level. I had to find or to, to start together with my colleagues. I think it was five ministers, one from South Africa and one from Nigeria, myself and one from Senegal and one from Risotto. We, we founded what is now called the African Ministerial Council on Water, which is now an AU agency. And I was the first president of that council for four years. And uh, during that time, we were able to make strides, even demonstrating before the UN, to make sure that sanitation, <laughs> <laughs> sanitation is included in the MDG target. So that's how I started working on uh, but at the end of the day, when I look at it, I must say there has been an enabling environment for me to move on. One was the wind of change that called for affirmative action mm. because in 1994-95, no, we, we made a new constitution. And there we made it a, a constitutional requirement that there will be affirmative action for gender 
and uh, even for intake in the universities, we made an extra point, extra point for girls to be enrolled in the university. And in the constitution, it is required that 30% at every administrative level must be for gender consideration. So now that means that it is a continuous process. We are every time we generate new leaders coming into the mainstream. How have we performed? I really want to say that the performance of women, women has been excellent in our government. We have really tried our best. And uh, uh, at one time, in fact, the last government, we had the woman vice president, and that was very, very, very uh, great for the women. Now we have a male vice president. We have got a speaker, Madame Rebecca Kadaga. She is very, very strong. Chances are that she may even contest for presidency. But that is, again, because of the affirmative action and the support. We now have most of the, out of 21 ministries of government, Six of them are headed by women, including the one I had, that is tourism. The other one is finance, the other next one is the Minister of Energy, mm -hmm. the next one is the Minister of Trade, the next one is the Minister of Education, the next one is the Minister of Information. All very strong ministries, mm -hmm. and uh, we are very proud that we are moving on steadily. We had one uh, aspiring to take over defense. We got her to the level of uh, deputy minister. But we still have our hopes that we'll get even into <laughs> defense. So that is our ambition. What is all that? What can I summarize it? Um, one thing that I think women have been sensitized to have ambition. Because when you don't have ambition, things pass by. But now women have the ambition to be in the leadership. Mm -hmm. And secondly, women have that inborn, natural, love to serve. It's, we are born with it, because when you are in a family, nobody tells you what to do, but you know how to do it, and do it on time. So that gives us an, upper, an age over men. Men, they want things done for them, but for us, we do things <laughs> on our own. That is the difference. And in fact, recently, some men started commenting, especially in Uganda, women are taking over almost everything. In every line of business you find, more women than men. So that is to our credit, but we don't want to discourage men because we don't want them to be dependents. So <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, that has been my experience. I, I think I owe it to even to the international community because they have been able to, to represent my country, to represent my region at the global forum. And I think uh, every woman should be given that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nuru. Hi. Well, we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I would like to state uh, a statement made by Madeleine Albright. There is a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Yes. <laughs> I love that statement. Anyways. Uh, I would say that my mother, uh, she was my mentor then, my late mother. And uh, in, the in the 1950s, early 1950s, 50s, she was a teacher. And that was actually how I got empowered uh, indirectly uh, to say that it's okay for women to go out to work. So from the start uh, of my life, I would say that my mother actually built the bridge uh, in my mind saying that a woman is actually empowered. And uh, with this regard to, I was uh, educated in the uh, US, and I would say that Hillary Clinton is my mentor, still is my mentor, was mm -hmm. and still. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in the World Bank, I was working in the World Bank as senior advisor, that was way back in 2006 to 2008. I followed her, her campaign trip, and I still have hope for her in 2016. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are the challenges? What were the challenges faced by me uh, to get where I am now? I would say that I was lucky to have uh, top leaders who are gender sensitized. Uh, for example, in, 20, uh, in 24, 2004, my prime minister then was uh, Abdullah Badawi. <laughs> he was uh, very gender sensitized in a way that he launched the uh, women in decision making in public sector. <coughs> 
in 2004 to reach 30% in uh, 2016, uh, 30%. Now, uh, back to uh, those days, you know, it was difficult for us to get hold of uh, Prime Minister, but we, the Ministry of Women and Family and Community De Development, we strategized ourselves. We need to push this agenda hard. And uh, with regard to cabinet ministers, they are all, most of them are males. And I think New Zealand is very lucky to have a woman female uh, prime minister because agenda got passed easily. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, it was difficult. And uh, what we did was, the, the prime minister then, we strategized. One is getting hold of the prime minister's um, time to launch, to launch the policy to ensure that everybody mm. in Malaysia would listen to the policy. That's very important. Get hold of the Prime Minister. Second, we did was we buy in via media. Media will pump up the news and also by the fact that they will build up the momentum to the launching of, uh, of the policy. And finally, of course, the NGOs. Most of the professional women, they are NGOs. That too, in 2011, when, when my Prime Minister Najib Raza launched the, uh, the, the women, uh, women uh, board directors, 30%, uh, we use the NGOs too. And I'm, I'm very happy that uh, you acknowledge, uh, UNDP acknowledge us in, uh, in your new book to be launched today about our decision making um, uh, process. And uh, I would like to comment on what uh, Excellency Clark mentioned about uninterrupted, uninterrupted service, or you call it uh, yeah, interrupted uh, service, right? Yeah. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, for example, uh, recently last year, we have this policy of uh, second pick because we do not have, then we did not have second pick women in, uh, in service. Mm -hmm. Now we have one whereby we give incentives to the uh, private sector to ensure that they get hold of, uh, they get uh, tax deduction from the Ministry of Finance in order to retrain those who have left the service to be retrained into the, the, the employment sector again. And uh, besides that, we have daycare centers. All ministries in Malaysia, we have daycare centers. Mm. It is compulsory mm. to have daycare centers to ensure that women, they are not left out in the uh, employment mm. uh, sector. So uh, I think that that's it for, mm. for now. Yeah, I can continue fun. again later. Great insights uh, and both answers to that question. I'll come back when I, when I sum up uh, a little bit later. Thank you so much. I'm going to come now to Patricia and then to Intan, uh, asking them about some of the key challenges they see women in their countries facing in making it into decision-making positions and public admin, uh, what would need to change to speed things up, and uh, any s insights you have about things that have worked in your country in this respect and any lessons learned. So Patricia, uh, over to you first. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Um, very loaded question. <laughs> but I think maybe I just wanted to just divert for a minute. For me what is important in all of these debates on gender is that they need to be balanced. They need to be balanced and also spelling out what is the role and responsibility of each woman themselves to empower themselves and make sure that we don't develop a victim mentality. Because once you have developed that victim mentality, it's difficult to break out of there. And one of, I think, the personal responsibility for each and every woman is to work on breaking down the stereotypes about one, how women should behave, how we should speak, how we should dress, and all of those kind of things, and deal with the patriarchy in, in our society. And if each and every woman around the world begin to take personal responsibility to deal with those uh, stereotypes and patriarchy, I think we will have a, a, a better world. Now, in, in South Africa, we continue to have these debates. Uh, and we've got lots of women representation in parliament. One of the, I think we're number seven in the world with women in, 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 as members of parliament. But I always sit back and I say, did that bring about change um, in parliament, in policy making, in government? Because we need to also be careful to find the balance there. Not to say that we want 50% representation to achieve what? 
as women, as the uh, putting more women into government is that the panacea for all the challenges that we face as a country. So yes, we, we've done very well, but I think what we still need to do a lot more is how do you use that power and the presentation and the representation of women in their numbers in parliament and all of these institutions to make sure uh, that, that we look back and, and look at what is happening to our other sisters out there. What, what, what role do, do, do we have to play? So yes, we, we still face a, a, a number of challenges, even though we've got uh, this very good constitution. We have got uh, one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. But those rights contained in the constitution will remain paper rights unless we claim them as women. We have to claim those rights. And I think the, the women in power and in position should be leading that on behalf of the many voiceless women out there in our rural areas especially. And, and, and I, I see my role uh, today as a, as a woman mayor, and but also we also have a woman as a governor in our province, that we must lead in dealing with those deficiencies of leaving women behind. But I go as far as getting it right into the homes of families, because that's where it must all begin. Mm. And it begins with us as mothers. It is us as mothers who instill some of us, we instill in our children, we make more of the boy child than what we make of the girl child. It's the girl child's duty to to do the dishes, to clean the house, you know, those st stereotypes. So right inside the family, you need to teach your children th that, that women are equal. Because one, if you bring up these little brats, <laughs> um, one day when they go out and they get married, they, they want to demand the same from their partners or their wives because they're being spoiled by their mothers to bits. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, that's why I always put the emphasis because if you get that grounding right inside your family and you go outside into the world that is so many barriers, you'll be able to handle it because you handle it at, at home. So yes, what are the challenges that we face in South Africa? Very, very high woman abuse. Mm. The sad part is actually for me, the rape of young children. Mm. You know, every time I open the paper and I see that, you know, you, you want to cry and you want to scream because there can be absolutely no justification for raping a young child. And so, again, we need leadership. We need our president to lead and on a daily basis pronounce as a leader of the country that these issues are not right. Not once in a while when it's Women's Day Women's Day on the 8th of August or International Women's Day. Women's issues must be attended to 365 days a year, not on special days or on special debates. So, but I'm very hopeful, having said all of what I said, I'm, I'm still very hopeful because if you look in Africa, uh, you, you can see a lot more women have come through um, as presidents, as ministers, my sister here, and mayors and, and deputy ministers and all of that. So we are making progress, but we, we need that universal drive with our sisters around the world, that women's issues in Malaysia or in Singapore and Uganda, that we should be talking more to each other. I find that we tend to speak to each other when it comes to, um, to conferences. But when I leave here, when am I gonna see Helen again? Um, when am I going to see my sister from Uganda again? What do we decide before we leave here today? What I must do and what responsibility you need to give to me as a mayor of a city of 5.2 million people with at least half of them women? And then when we come back to another session in a year or two, we can report back. But we cannot continue to talk, talk, talk. We need to walk the talk. Thank you very much. MP, Intern Azura. Yes. Um, 
think if I can share some statistics in Singapore first, uh, if we look at women in leadership positions in our administrative service, about 30% of our permanent secretaries are women. Um, as Honourable Helen Clark mentioned earlier, um, in Parliament, we have about 24% um, who are women elected members of Parliament. Um, this number is, we have made an improvement over the years, but um, of course there is a way to go. If I can just share with you other numbers, for example, in uh, labour force participation rate, about 60% of our women are working compared to 75% of men who are working. And if you look at their wages, the average wage of women in Singapore is about $3,700 compared to about $5,000 for men. But interestingly, if you look at women graduates in Singapore, um, about 28% of our women are graduates compared to 24% who are men. So we do wonder what happened to the mm. women graduates. You know, where, where do they end up and why is it that wages are still lagging behind? Um, the gender wage gap has improved from 2007 to about five years, from 27% gap to 26% gap. But I think we still have work to do in closing the gap. But like what Mayor Dalil mentioned earlier, be beyond chasing numbers, I think it's also important for us to ask a question, what does it mean? What does it mean for us as a society, not just for the women, but as a society? And beyond policies that we have, explicit policies, the other important thing is the implementation. How does society accept? How do families accept changes with regard to the role of women? And how can we get the support of employers? Um, if we just look at um, employment, women in the workforce, I think policy, in terms of policies, we are quite fortunate here in Singapore because we have policies that encourage women to work. If I can just share a few with you. For example, there is our, in terms of taxes, income taxes, we have women working mother child relief, which is quite generous. 15% um, for the first child, 20% for the second child of the mother's earned income, 25% for third, fourth children, which is very good. And up to 100% of the mother's earned income can be um, Claim, be claimed for tax relief. We also have working mother, child, uh, working mother child care subsidy for mothers who work and to put their children in child care. Um, we have 16-week maternity leave, which is not too bad, quite generous, probably not the way of the Scandinavian countries, but I think it's, we, have, we have improved over the years from eight weeks when I was a working mother to 16 weeks now. Um, we have baby bonuses. But flexi work is something that we have, we still struggling to implement it in our workforce. Uh, Mrs. Yufu Yishun, who's here with us in the audience when she was Minister of State in Ministry of Community uh, and Family Development, 10 years ago she was a strong advocate for flexi work, but even now we're finding it a challenge to encourage our employers to institute flexi work, you know, encourage mothers to go back to work, work flexibly at their own time from home. So beyond policies, beyond the numbers, I think it's really about changing mindsets as well. You'd be surprised to know that even in this day and age, when I meet some of my residents, um, I have mothers who stay at home, who do not work, um, and who may have qualifications that make them employable in the workforce, but when probed, they tell me that, oh, it's because my husband, um, who earns $800 a month, doesn't allow me to work, even though she is capable of earning twice that amount <laughs> a month, because he wants me to stay at home and take care of the children. When in fact, if she works, there are schemes to assist her uh, in terms of childcare fees where she needs to pay just a nominal sum every month. So I think mindsets still need to change and we haven't quite done that yet in Singapore. Mm. So I think beyond just looking at numbers and beyond just looking at leadership positions, I think as a whole, as a society, um, there is still quite a bit that we need to do um, in terms of changing mindsets, changing perceptions and acceptance that men and women, we are really partners in the home. Um, we are not subservient, one is not mm. subservient to the other. And indeed, if we are strong as partners in the family, I think as a society, we can do a lot better. Mm. Mm. Let me bring Madam Nin in now for perspective from uh, Vietnam and reflecting on anything you've heard and also perhaps suggesting what do you think the most important steps are that can be taken to move to a critical mass of women in the decision-making circles? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, um, gentlemen and ladies. 
I often have the opportunity in Vietnam to address audiences on this issue of gender uh, equality uh, and, and gender balance, and I always look into the audience. How many gentlemen are there down there? Or is it, you know, on the 8th of March, uh, the International Women's Day, or on the 20th of October, Vietnam's uh, Women's Day, it's women talking to women, preaching mm. to the choir. In Vietnamese, we say it's sticky rice on sticky rice. <laughs> so today it's not very important. There should be many gentlemen, but definitely for national audiences. I always look at how many gentlemen in the audience, because of course the gentlemen, as I will say later, play a very important role in gender uh, equity. So I'd like to suggest three things uh, from the realities of Vietnam, uh, and I hope it speaks across uh, the world as well, uh, three uh, steps, important steps for having a critical mass of women in decision making, especially in public administration. First, I'd like to quote from Sheryl Sandberg's uh, Lee name, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, uh, mm -hmm. CEO of Facebook, and I had the pleasure to be invited to write the foreword to the Vietnamese edition mm -hmm. of Lean In. And I agree with her that first and foremost, women must want to sit at the table. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to do that, they need to break free of their mm -hmm. own constraints right in their uh, minds and break free of the role stereotyping that mm -hmm. we've been speaking about, and at the heart of it all, therefore, is education. Education from the family to the school, to society, in the media, so on and so forth. Let me tell you, you know, an interesting reality. You have this young man who leaves his uh, well-off family to go abroad to study, where he needs to take care of himself by himself, so he uh, learns how to wash his laundry, how to do his omelets and <laughs> feed himself, you know. And then the day he returns home and gets married, yeah. his mother makes sure that he doesn't do a thing inside the family. Mm. And because there's no pressure on him to behave in a progressive manner, the way he learned when he went out to the world, right. so back to the old ways. You see, and he accepts the way. And so, family education, especially in societies like in Vietnam, where the Confucian remnants are still there, you know. So what I say when I talk to women, I say, you, we, as mothers-in-law, let's be very vigilant that we do not, you know, continue the stereotyping right in the way we run or we co-run mm -hmm. our families. So that's the first point. Second point, of course, is the need for political resolve. I mean, top down. So the other one is bottom up, we the women ourselves. And the second, of course, is top down, the political resolve from the country's leadership. And it means the party, the political organizations, it means the executive, it means the legislative. So in Vietnam, uh, there has been discussions about do we need special measures, as mentioned mm -hmm. by the uh, administrator. Now, of course, in Vietnam, we have moved away from um, positive discrimination and anything that would mean that women cannot be or should not be as excellent mm -hmm. as their male peers. Mm -hmm. So that's not we, what we want. We don't want any lowering of standards. Mm. What we mean is, for example, when I was in Parliament in National Assembly for one term, five years, towards the end, I rang a bell. Because the achievements that we had in terms of national parliamenta parliamentary representation, right after the end of the war, there was a special National Assembly, 75, 76, lasted only a year and a half, two years. Mm that was the peak of female representation. In special circumstances, we reached 32%. Mm. By the time, during my term, 
uh, it was still very high, 27.3. But my sense of you know, the conservatism that I discovered in the National Assembly, I said, you know what? Gender equality gains have to be, you know, maintained, fought for constantly. They are not a perpetual given. So be careful, we might slip. And slip we did. So the complacency, so one of the things, the last things I said on gender equality in the National Assembly is Vietnam is suffering from complacency on gender equity and gender equality mm -hmm. because we were among the earliest nations in mm -hmm. the developing world in Asia to put gender equality into the constitution mm -hmm. back in 1946. But so from, but let's not be complacent. We need to work to consolidate our gains mm -hmm. and continue uplifting them. Mm -hmm. So in the elections in 2007, it slipped to 25 point something. Next elections in, you know, most recently, it slipped again to 24.4. So now, I think that shook, that shook, you know, a public opinion, especially political leadership opinion. And so let's watch. The next challenge will be in 2016 elections to see whether we can stop that slipping, you know, uh, trend. And I believe that therefore, what we, in Vietnam, the, the legislation is fine overall, mm. except for the age differential, mm. a retirement differential. There still is a differential. But the worst part of it is that it's being used to put a ceiling, mm. a lower ceil age ceiling for promotion, yes. mm. for planning into the positions of leadership, for sending for further training. Mm. So that's where, you know, the a retirement age differential really is counterproductive. It's being used, you know, as mm. a tool to uh, put a, an additional glass ceiling. Finally, the third measure, I think, is support by women. Mm. We should not take it as a given that there is solidarity. Um, who is it that mentioned that uh, women who do not support other women should go to uh, Madeline help? Albright. Oh, Madeleine Albright, yes. <laughs> and, well, it's true that sometimes it's the women themselves who, who do not trust, mm. who are skeptical about the ability to lead uh, of other women. So we need that support, that political education work among women to support rising, rising women and their families, as I mentioned, and very importantly, the men. Because if we talk only to the women, but the men shake their heads, then it's going to be, to be hard. And so here I would emphasize the importance of mentoring, and the importance of the media. I, I recently spoke to one of the multinational corporations in Vietnam where many women have opportunities to rise. There are quite a number of women in senior management positions in the MNCs mm. in Vietnam. I, don't, I suppose in other uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. But what I'm saying is you have a responsibility not to um, prolong stereo gender stereotyping. Look, so you sell your washing powder, and of course this very famous female singer is there playing housewife, you know, uh, and then it's and then uh, the ready-to-eat noodles. It's always the 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 father, the son sitting there, and and mom is preparing those ready-to-eat noodles. So what I'm telling, I'm going to do a campaign to the multinational corporations, dare to show a, a man serving ready-to-eat noodles to his wife and, and, and his daughter. And don't put <laughs> just a woman in front of the washing machine. After all, male students have used washing machines when they were uh, students. So this is something that we could do with the media 
and uh, some of the more open-minded corporations. This is a, a wonderfully articulate panel. <laughs> and I think I've got so many insights. Uh, time is always as short, but I, I'm looking at, a, at our audience and saying, is there anyone who's really got a, a burning question or reflection they'd like to offer uh, before we move to, to, uh, to wrap up? I know people always have other things in their diaries too, so we can't go unduly over time. But is there anyone out there who's thinking, I'd really like to ask one of these incredible ladies? Yes, down here. Varma from Flamingo. Um, I know you talked about the age differential for retirement. I guess I don't, who retires faster, men or women, and women. why? What women. is the reason? It's, it's, I don't know what the reason's been traditionally, but there's often been a, a younger retirement age for women, and as people have said, this caps careers <laughs> at the point when you could probably be moving into the top Right, job. and what I don't get is women mm. live longer. Yeah, so that's right. You think the economic something? Exactly. Mm. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> I can answer. Please, please, Madam Nin from because your Vietnam. Because Vietnam suffers from that. I've been battling this for uh, ever since I was in the National Assembly until to, uh, this present day, yeah. and to show the conservatism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, very uh, sh uh, in short. Vietnam, together with so-called socialist countries, applied that retirement age differential from the 60s. It was meant mm -hmm. to be a preferential policy, more or less saying, you know, we know how hard it is for women to, mm -hmm. uh, to give birth and take care of young children. So they need to have the priority to retire early, but with the same retirement benefits. So in those years, it was perceived as a preferential treatment. Mm -hmm. And because in Vietnam in those years, uh, there were not many women who ha were educated enough, who, you know, and so on and so forth. So it was more in the manual labor uh, kind of uh, sector. Mm -hmm. So people accepted that easily. Mm -hmm. Now today, in, across the world, uh, retirement age differential has been, uh, you know, gotten rid of mm -hmm. nearly everywhere except a few countries, including Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I've been battling that, saying today is a different, is a different world. Mm. Vietnam needs to, yes. you know, uh, mm. do as the rest of the world because of some mm. of the reasons you mentioned. Mm. Women live longer, they are just as fit, so and so forth, mm. and just as able. Mm. And because mm. precisely of what I mentioned, mm. it's being used as a weapon mm. to, you mm. know, put a glass ceiling on women's mm. promotion. Mm. Yeah. You are supposed to, uh, to apply for director general position only until 45. Mm. Because the principle is you need to serve at least 10 years. Mm. Five years is not worth promoting you, yeah. you know, and so on yeah, and so yeah. forth. Yeah. So th yeah. this is completely absurd, completely mm. absurd. And today mm. I was shrugging my shoulders again because, because of the Social Security Fund is going to go bankrupt. So they need the, the monies mm. from having people work longer. So okay. now there's a, 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 I mean, <laughs> yes, I mean to put more money into the social security uh, fund. And so now uh, they are thinking of raising women's age, retirement age to 60, but men to 62. Mm -hmm. So they are, you know, narrowing the, the age differential. So it r makes me smile. You, know, you, would, you would think, you would think that, you know, the men are sort of clinging to that differential to show, you know, somehow men are, are more needed, you know. I don't know. So, uh, but I hope we'll be, we'll get there, uh, you know, in due time. We wish you well in your battle. <laughs> <laughs> so something that was meant to be helpful, well, had a good intention, has ended up being very unhelpful. Yeah, yes, know. just right there in the, on the aisle. Yes. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm Welcome from Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm glad that I got this invitation. I'm really excited. I'm in mm. the panel. You're doing a wonderful job. But I wish it was on webinar so other people around the globe were able to actually mm. participate in what yeah. you have delivered. Mm. I wanted to suggest, because mostly we are told women are their worst enemies, can we recoin 
and come up with another phrase. Yeah. Women are the best friends of women. Thank yes. you. Very good suggestion. Yes, over, over here. Good evening, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, mine is a simple question. Uh, I'm Noyen from Nigeria. Uh, my question or my suggestion is to Her Excellency. Uh, the, the mayor mentioned a while ago that we all go to these conferences. Mm. After this, when am I gonna see you again? When is she gonna say this? Is there anything you, UNDP could do to monitor the discussions of women and make sure that some of the things we raise in our conferences are actually being implemented and followed up in various countries. So is there anything that you and or like a body you have, apart from going to various countries individually to assist the women, is there a general body that we have a representation from all the continents and you can have a voice in the UN uh, assembly that some of these things are implemented. We have mm. had the Geneva Convention, all this convention, mm. all this, none of them are being implemented. They are simply in paper. But we as a woman, mm. a woman uh, um, fora or agenda should have our own union, mm. just like the UN. This is a women union mm. that we women, we monitor the things that are concerning you as a mayor, the mm. things that are concerning you from Malaysia, from from Singapore, mm. from all over the place, that there are women in these countries that are actually raising the flag and following up that are implementation. It would be very great to say that happened because we all go to these conferences and we dispatch mm. and we do it in little, little bits. In, but if mm. we can come together, as, I think we'll have a mm. more powerful mm. uh, result. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so three great um, uh, contributions from the floor, and I'm going to try and answer that and, and, and sum up. So because this is a very short, sharp conference today. So <laughs> I'm very encouraged by these cameras. Does this mean we've captured it all online and we're going to post it online so people can share it? Because I think it's been really a brilliant panel. I wish we had all day without our panel. There's been so many uh, insights. Secondly, responding to that question about where you take it from here. Firstly, this kind of session is, is actually there to inspire, to share experiences, and we, we've had some great insights today from, from, from each. Uh, from the point of view of, of UNDP, and there may be others of you in the room who work actively on, on these issues, apart from the, the, the women on the panel, uh, we take these insights into the work we do in country to share the experiences. Because, you know, getting things done in country uh, is about saying, we'd like to move in this direction. Who else tried this? And what, what issues did they run into? And, and how did they do it? Uh, how did they go from having fine words in a constitution to making something happen in practice? How did they measure it? How did they monitor it? I agree with you, measuring and monitoring is very important. And one of the most important things about the Millennium Development Goals was it did set up measurement and monitoring. So countries have done their reports. You know, we know where everybody stands on implementation, on MDG3, on women's equality and empowerment, on universal education, which of course includes education for girls, on maternal mortality, on, on poverty. Uh, and, and going into the next development agenda post-2015, there's a huge call coming from our global consultation uh, for disaggregated data. So we really do know what's happening to women. We know what's happening to people with disabilities. We know what's happening to indigenous people. We know what's happening to people who may be marginalized for whatever reason in society. We need disaggregated data because then we can measure uh, and, and see what other measures need to be taken to really reach these goals. So I'm completely with you in, in, in keeping a, a focus on that. Uh, summing up, you know, Maria began, I thought, with a, a wonderful exposition of how all the skills she had were used in the different uh, roles she took on. And you, you mentioned, Maria, that uh, as a mother, that time out you had, you learned a lot about time management. One thing that annoys me so much about having to show uh, time in post for promotion is that often where women miss out is they've had these years out with their children. They've learned so many skills, and yet somehow that isn't valued in the career structure. 
you took the skills you had as a mother and managing your time into being more effective than in the jobs in government that you went back into. It's a very, very uh, important insight. And also the way you took on water as a huge issue to women. Who does the carriage of water? Women. You don't see so many men walking with the water on their head or dragging it behind. It's the women and the children. Uh, and you, you, the work you did with the orphans also f fantastic. Narul, you started with one of Madeleine Albright's many famous quotes. And uh, recently, Madeleine went on Twitter. And I think it was Ariana Huffington who tweeted Madeleine. She said, Madeleine, there's a special place in hell for women who don't retweet others. <laughs> so, so that none of you enjoy that special place in hell, my Twitter handle is at Helen Clark UNDP. Thank you. <laughs> but you gave us uh, great examples about Malaysia actually having a strategy for women in, in participation in public administration. And what an inspiration to hear that every ministry in KL has childcare provision for women. Fantastic, what a, what a role uh, model. Uh, Patricia uh, reminded us uh, that we also have to ask the question, apart from wanting equal representation in principle, because it's the right thing to do, what do we want to do with it? And I think a, a number of you have offered insights about how you've used the personal power and position you had to really work on things that were of interest to women and of course uh, there by inference to the broader society. Uh, but uh, both uh, you and I think uh, also Madam Nin talked about the importance of what happens in the home. You know, women and the influence we have in the home to bring up a generation that thinks much more progressively about uh, uh, the role of, of women. Um, uh, our MP from, from Singapore gave us good facts and figures, and also stress the importance of flexi work. You know, the women do have particular family responsibilities in so many cases, and the workforce needs to be uh, sensitive to that. And Madam Nin, uh, you, you quoted from Sheryl Sandberg. I was always a bit pu puzzled by Sheryl's book because I don't think I ever lent out in my life. I always lent in. But if she's encouraging every woman to lean in, uh, we're, we're, we're absolutely uh, uh, with her, of course. And you emphasise the importance of mentoring support by other women, and that's something we've identified uh, in this uh, report that we're having the soft launch of today, the great importance of women mentoring other women. So I think we will see this morning as a great mentoring session for each other, and I really want to thank our, our wonderful panel uh, we will get this up online on the uh, Global Centre for Public Service Enterprise uh, website and hopefully UNDP's uh, main website as well. Uh, the Global Centre is also on Twitter at UNDP Public Pub Serve or something like that, which doesn't mean beer, it means public <laughs> service. Um, but uh, thank, thank you so much. Max, are there any words you want to say by way of closing us off? But I'm going to thank our panellists right now. Thank you.